Thanks very much to Philip for organizing everything and uh, letting me speak. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is, is in some way related to what Alexander talked about yesterday, the, the, the group theoretic algorithms, and also what Renaud was talking about uh, today, Voronoi um, domains and the like. Um, but I'm, I'm going to have a, a, give a very kind of hands-on talk, because I spend a lot of time playing with nerdy computer code. So I'm going I'm to talk about GAP and how you might implement uh, some of these ideas in GAP or use what Alexander has already implemented in GAP to make calculations. So uh, let me just uh, apologize. <laughs> I, I claim that this is about computational topology. Computational topology is a growing area. I'm going to be talking about one very specific GAP package that I'm involved with. So um, uh, and details of the package are available online. And if, you, if you're interested in the kind of the, the, a broader perspective, then uh, Nathan Dumfeld has a nice uh, web page at com computop.org. You'll find that where there are a list of lots of programs like Snappy and, and uh, Regina and all kinds of things. But I won't be talking about those. What I'm going to try to do, I haven't tried this before, at the, at the end of the, the session, I, I'll, I'll stop with some gap problems for those who actually want to play with gap. And if you don't want to play with gap, you'll have a longer coffee break. I thought I'd do it like that. So you, you can, yeah. OK, so the outline of, of the, what I'll be talking about. I'm going to start off talking about um, elementary algebra, very elementary algebraic topology. How do you calculate things like the fundamental group and cohomology of a space X with coefficients in a module? And uh, I'll spend much of today talking about that. Then I'll go on to a special case where the space X is actually the classifying space of a group. So um, then I suppose what I'm talking about is the cohomology of the group. And I'll even talk about um, the case where G is not just a group, but a simplicial group, because I'm well aware that uh, uh, Grenoble is the, the home of a software package named after a Grenoble cat called Kenzo, by the, the software package developed by Francis Seger. And uh, so I'll touch on some of the ideas that are used in that, which are also implemented in GAP. And then I'll finish off my talks uh, with a little bit about uh, the cohomology of the easy case SL2R, where R is, OK, maybe the integers or uh, the integers of some, some quadratic number field. And so that links to modular forms. And some of the, the, the later problems will be gap problems about quadratic forms, about modular forms. OK, so that's the, that's the plan. To start then, the question is, how do you represent a, a topological space on a computer? And there are various possibilities. I guess the most obvious are the ones that books tend to start with. Well, let me, throughout the, 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 today, I'll, I'll just stick with the torus as an example of a topological space. So how do I do calculations with the torus on a computer? Um, so a, a very standard way is to create a triangulation of the torus, which is, I've pictured over there. Um, and then you can certainly input that triangulation into uh, the computer. Uh, you can consider it as a simplicial complex, maybe an ordered simplicial complex. I have to be a bit fussy. The, 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 there's an ordering on the vertices. It makes things more natural on a computer. So the, the vertices would be a list. Uh, and then there'll be various uh, edges in your triangulation. Um, so, so you input the, the, the list of lists, k, being the simplicial complex. So for each edge, you'll input a, an ordered list for each edge, and then for each triangle over there in your triangulation, you'll in input a, a, a list of length three, and there you have a, a computer representation of the torus, which I'll just keep a record. I think if I counted right, there are nine vertices there, 27 edges, and 18 triangles. You can actually do better. I think you can, the minimal uh, triangulation has, I think it's eight vertices, so you, if you're bored with what I'm saying, you can try to recreate that. Another way, um, which is popular in, in the area of applied topology, is to use what, what the applied topologists call cubical complexes. I'm not so happy with that, with that terminology, but 
Um, so there's a recent, well, maybe 15 years ago, actually not so recent, a good book on computational homology by uh, people at um, uh, Krakow University, Marianne Rozek and, and co-authors, uh, where they, they, they've come to computational topology, computational homology from the field of numerical analysis. And so they've been very interested in, in performing exact computations in, in, in um, dynamical systems. And they use cubical complexes. So a cubical complex is something which is made up of cubes of various dimensions. Um, but what they mean by it really is uh, you're in Rn. I mean, this picture is in R3. And you imagine R3 tiled by three-dimensional unit cubes. Um, where the vertices of the cubes are, are uh, integer coordinates. And then it's very easy to record this kind of a space on the computer uh, using arrays, a three by three by three array. So, uh, the, the, and, and, and for some, some problems, this kind of representation of spaces is handy. Computer graphics uses this a lot. Um, so if you're interested in problems in computer graphics, uh, this is often used, and okay, it's it's not quite as efficient as the simplicial complex. More vertices, uh, edges, and faces. And I will say, uh, because I'll give a, a demonstration in a moment, that cubes are not the only t uh, tessellations of three space that you might want to use. In particular, the permutahedron, this shape down here, is a nice uh, tile for three-dimensional space. And that has some features that, that make it, uh, in, for some problems, better than a cube. Uh, but, you can, but again, you can, you can represent uh, permutahedral spaces using 3 by 3 by 3 arrays. OK. And a third uh, representation, which is a bit more efficient, I suppose we can use this picture, where now we have fewer vertices, uh, only four vertices, fewer edges and so on, fewer faces. Um, so what, does, what is that? Well, I guess that's a regular CW complex. So this picture of the torus, what have you got? You've, you've got faces of various dimensions, and you can store it on the computer as a pole set, a face lattice. You just store the face lattice. Um, for, for a regular CW complex. And it has fewer vertices, edges, and faces. And then uh, the various data types I've talked about, there are, are constructions, maybe even functors if you define everything properly. There are constructions which go from one to another. So for example, from um, a regular CW complex, you can uh, do barycentric subdivision, and you can produce uh, a, a homeomorphic simplicial complex with far more uh, cells, but, but it's homeomorphic. From a pure cubical complex, or a pure permutahedral complex, you can think of the, in, in the cubic, cubical case, that you can think of the three-dimensional cubes as being a cover of your space. Maybe if you just take a, a small neighborhood, you can think of it as an open cover. And then you can take the nerve of the open cover, and you'll end up with a simplicial complex. So, so there are, there are func or constructions like that. Oh, I actually describe it. So that's the nerve. If you have a, a cube, pure cubical complex, let me say that pure means that every, you know, it's a collection of three-dimensional cells. Every top dimensional cell is, say, dimension three. Then you can work at the nerve. It's a simplicial complex. Um, just taking intersections, and then there's the barycentric subdivision, uh, which is the order complex of the face lattice. Okay, so there are there are very standard ways to, to implement spaces on a computer, and now I can go to my gap section zero. This is where things will break down. But let's just um, so I'm trying to kind of advertise the package that I'm talking about. So let me go to um, gap. I've put all of this code up on, on the web page that I sent a link out to, so if you, if you want to play with, with this afterwards, you, you can re reproduce it uh, at your leisure. But if I type in various commands, just to illustrate what I'm talking about, 
Um, I'm going to do this primitively. I'm going to copy uh, various things. Ah, hang on, I have to do it click first. In gap, if I can find it. Uh, what I've done there is I've loaded, so gap comes as a core system, and then it's got various packages. So I start off by loading uh, the package I'm talking about. And then, um, OK, so I've, I've, we've got not theory. We can think of a not uh, as being actually a physical knot, being a three-dimensional rope. Uh, and so we can think of a knot. We can, we can model it as, I say, a cubical complex, as I've done here. <clears throat> and enter it uh, into the computer. And now the next command might explain what I've done there. Um, I'm going to display the thing I've just created. And now we might have to wait a few seconds. Um, I'm using asymptote software for displaying, which is a piece of software that, that oh no, it was quick, okay, so for, for, for LaTeX. But here you see, for example, you can see it's a knot, it's, that's a thick piece of rope <laughs> going around, it's the trefoil knot, and it's made up of unit cubes uh, in three-dimensional space. So that's an example of a, of a cubical complex uh, representing the trefoil knot. In fact, the embedding of the knot, you know, the, the knot is an embedding, so. And let's go on few more. Um, I'll do a permuta permutahedral version of the trefoil knot. Ah, not so easy. Hang on. It takes longer to to produce pictures with permutahedra. That's just due to my programming rather than. Oh, there we go. So there we have a, a same knot, but represented as a union of uh, permutahedra. So it's a permutahedral, I, I don't know. It's, it's a, so that's a permutahedral complex, but. You could represent that just as an array, a binary array of zeros and ones. You put a one everywhere there's a brick and a zero everywhere that there isn't. And what can we do? Uh, at this stage, not too much. We can, um, we can ask for the size of the things we've created. So. Um, so, so, okay, the size of L, which was the, um, the cubicle knot, it has 92 bricks in it. Not particularly efficient, but there are 92 cu uh, unit cubes in the, in the knot L. No, in the knot K. Um, and then what we can do, we can, cr we can convert K to a regular CW complex. Because whenever you have a, a cubicle complex, a pure cubicle complex, or a permutahedral complex, you can just change how it's represented on the computer. You can store its face lattice, and you get a, um, what I call a regular CW complex. So you're going to have more cells now, because I'm counting all of the cells of every dimension, not just the top dimensional cells. And that's the size there. And just a few more commands, and then we go back to. Oh, I can create the nerve of, let me do two together. So this should be a simplicial complex that I convert those knots to. Um, so there I've created two simplicial complexes. The nerve of K was two-dimensional because if you think about it, when cubes fit together, you, things aren't so nice. But, but the, the nice feature of... Um, Permutahedra is if if that if they touch then they touch in a in a in a face of, of you know a facet, so you get a one-dimensional representation here. So what I have there really is a, a circle, um, and the, for the K I get something homotopy equivalent to a circle, 
And I think that's about it, is it? So, oh yeah, and then we can just check that gap is <laughs> uh, performing calculations correctly. We can calculate the Euler characteristic and hope that we get the same answer in each case, which we do, zero, the Euler characteristic. Okay, so there's a, a computer demonstration. Uh, we go back to the slides and continue with the possible ways of representing things on a, on a computer. So when, when I was uh, a student, I think this was called a semi-simplicial uh, set, but now it seems to be called a delta complex. So um, the picture over there, you can represent the torus as two triangles glued. Um, it's, you know, with, with opposite faces identified, an A and a B and a C. Um, and how would you store that on a, on a computer or, or, in, or how is it stored in, in algebraic topology textbooks? Um, you think of uh, three sets, the set of vertices, the set of edges, the set of faces, and then there are these face maps, uh, D0 takes an edge, every edge you think of as being oriented, and then the D0, I suppose you forget the zero vertex and take the opposite one, uh, the D1, you forget the one vertex and take the opposite one, which would be the zero, and then if you have a triangular face, you've got three vertices, so D0, I think, means you take the opposite edge, and, and so on. So you get three maps, and you can store those on a computer, and, and that's that you have a, a, a way of... St and again, that's slightly more efficient than um, the regular CW complex, fewer edges and fewer faces. What have we got here? So. Oh, yeah, so there, there are the, the, um, the face maps. And then these face maps satisfy some well-known identities, which I'll just record here. Um, because in any computer implementation, you would kind of make use of, of these identities that, uh, which I ho hold in the box. And that's a delta complex. And then you can ask, well, what happens if you want to be more efficient? So I, I want to the torus. I think the next example is with a sphere. Suppose you want to represent the sphere on a, on a computer. Uh, I suppose in any topology textbook, that's probably how you represent the sphere. You take a, a disk and glue the edges. So here you have one vertex. Um, well, you don't really have any edges. <laughs> uh, and you have one face, F, and they're all glued. So how is that represented on a computer? Well, you just enhance slightly the notion of a delta complex. You record it as a simplicial set. So again, you've got a collection of edges, vertices, and simplices, but now you allow degenerate simplices, degenerate um, edges, because there is no edge in this case, but we'll pr pretend there is. So we add in some degeneracies. I'm not going to use th this in this lecture, so I won't take too much time to explain it, but with some degenerate maps, the S's, uh, you can represent this structure on a computer, and that's a, a simplicial set. And so Francis Seger here in, in Grenoble has a, a lovely uh, software package, Kenzo, named after his cat, uh, which, is, which implements spaces in this fashion, and it can do uh, computations that, that the gap package certainly can't do, like homotopy groups of spheres you know, in, in low dimensions, but more than people can do by hand um, using, using this structure. OK, so that's. Um, Oh, yeah, so I, I should have said that then. What's a, de a degenerate case simplex? That should be precise. I suppose it's an ordered list. In a simplicial complex, your lists had better be of distinct entries. I suppose in a, in a simplicial set, you allow it's ordered, but you allow repetitions. Um, so the VIs aren't necessarily distinct. And then you, 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 you define your boundary and degeneracy maps, and they satisfy the standard definitions of a simplicial set. OK, so that's, that's all I want to say about that. Let's move on. Um, I suppose this is really how people think of the torus in any introductory topology book. Um, 
you take a sheet of paper and identify opposite edges. So how would you implement that on the computer? Um, there's one vertex, two edges, and one face. So there are at least two ways to do it, and there are two ways that are implemented in HAP. Um, well, firstly, before I talk about com computers, let's say that, that in, in the textbooks, uh, you represent this as a CW complex, not a regular one. So a CW complex is a, is a, a, a partition of your space into open cells. And um, if you like, the, the cells, the open cells, the, the, um, so DK denotes the closed k-dimensional disk. And so you have maps from your closed k-dimensional disk to the space. Uh, and the, 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 the maps restrict, are, are injective if you restrict to the interior. So that's what a CW complex is. And what's a regular CW complex that I've already talked about? A regular just means that, in fact, um, the maps are injective com completely. So they're, they're homeomorphisms. So if everything's a homeomorphism, you can just store the face lattice. If things aren't homeomorphisms on the boundary, you have to think a bit more about how you're going to store it on the computer. And I have two, two ways that I want to explain. Um, OK, there's a picture of a, of a circle, um, two CW decompositions of a circle. The first is regular. The boundary of every cell is a homeomorphism, whereas in the second case, there's only one one-dimensional cell and it's attached not by a homeomorphism because there's only a single zero cell. Right? The boundary doesn't map injectively. Yeah, and so let me talk about two ways to, to implement CW complexes as opposed to re regular CW complexes. Regular CW complexes, they're kind of easy. It's just the, the face post set. Um, okay, so the, the more standard representation uh, is the following. So I'm trying to represent the torus on a computer. So I might as well think of the universal cover of the torus. Uh, the universal cover of the torus, if I'm thinking of my torus as having, uh, as being, uh, you know, having a single zero cell, its universal cover will actually be a regular CW complex, but, but it'll be infinite. So uh, you, can, you can actually store the, 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 the universal cover rather than the, the, the torus itself. And what does storing the universal cover mean? Well, the universal cover, you, you'd want to... Sorry, is that true in general that the universal cover of all the universal Like in this case, yes. Oh, oh no, 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 no. I'm, I'm, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. I mean... So I don't have, I mean, in general, I don't know how to store a regular CW complex. Uh, sorry, a, 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 a non-regular CW complex. But there will be plenty of cases where things are non-regular for a, for a trivial reason. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, to, to store it as the universal cover then, uh, we've got this infinite tessellation of the, the universal cover is the plane. So you've got the infinite tessellation by uh, squares. But you've only, uh, under the fundamental group, which is translation in the x direction, translation in the y direction, you've only got one orbit of zero cell. There's only one orbit. So there's only need to store one representative of the orbit of the zero cells and record, I don't know how this works. Uh, oh, it does, it point. And record the the action of the fundamental group on this zero cell. So if you act by x, you move that zero cell to here in the universal cover. And if you act by y, you move it to here and so on. And if you act by x, y, you move it to there. So you can store that action on the computer. And that's a finite piece of information. You have to have a, the fundamental group. And just that picture over there is what you store. So it's very, very finite. Um, So basically, then, you have to store a fundamental domain for the free action of the fundamental group uh, and record how the fundamental group acts on the cells, uh, assuming that 
the universal curvature is, is regular now. Um, in practice, you might start off with a group, which might be a crystallographic group, <laughs> and you don't have a cell decomposition, so in, which, is, which is related to, to, to what Renaud was talking about in a much more complicated situation. So you may start off with, a, with a, say, a crystallographic group in Euclidean space. I want to create a fundamental domain, so you can use, well, you can use the, um, I suppose, the, the, the Dirichlet or the Voronoi domain or whatever it's called. Uh, so if you have an action, you can choose your favorite vector v and then somehow compute using convex hull algorithms uh, all of those po points u which are closer to v than any image of, of v. Okay, so gap session one. <laughs> now, now um, let's have a go. So for this gap session, I'm using uh, Polymic software. But what time did I start? Twenty. Hmm? Ten twenty grand. Okay, okay, that's good. That's good. Um, so for gap session one, I've already loaded HAP. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, input a space group, a crystallographic group, which there's a there's a, a, a library of crystallographic groups in GAP, Euclidean crystallographic groups. I've I've chosen a, a nice one. Uh, the, it's a three-dimensional crystallographic group, so it acts on R3, and I've decided to take group number 165 in this library. Um, and I'm going to create, using polymic convex hull algorithms, a a record of the universal cover. I call it a, a, an equivariant Euclidean space, but it, it's just a universal cover. So now we have to um, wait a little bit because uh, polymake is being called and things are being calculated, fundamental domains are being computed, and um, fingers crossed. Oh, we have it. We have a three-dimensional equivariant infinite uh, CW complex, and then we might want to do some easy things with that. Uh, like, oh, well, I might want to calculate the number of cell, the number of orbits of cells in each dimension. So maybe the, with hindsight, I would have used different terminology here, but um, I've created a, uh, an equivariant CW space Y. Y dot dimension with an integer gives the number of orbits of cells in that dimension. So for this example, I have nine orbits of zero cells and 18 orbits of one cells and so on. And one, one orbit of three cells because it's, it's a crystallographic group, it's a tessellation of R3. What does the XY Sorry? What does the XY Oh, so yeah, so in, in GAP, um, you can create, uh, I, well, I call them component objects. It, it's, it's, you know, object-oriented programming. So things associated to Y, it, it just means it's, it's a GAP notation. So it's, it's a function associated yeah, to Yeah, there's an exclamation. Well, depending on how it's created. But yeah, the way I've created them, you use the exclamation mark and a dot. Yeah. Uh, what else can we do with this? Um, oh, well, we can ask for the stabilizers of the various cells. Well, I just do one. Uh, it should give us the, the group that stabilizes a particular cell. Uh, so we can ask for this. And it gives us a matrix group. Uh, you can do things like what's the order of the group and so on. I mean, it's, it's a group. It's the identity, actually. Oh, it's the identity. Yes, I forgot. And in fact, the reason I chose group number 165 is that if I were to go through all of the cells, <laughs> I'd always get the identity. In this example, it's a Bieberbach group. The, the group acts freely, in the, I've chosen it so that the group acts freely on the universal cover. So what I have now is I have a universal cover, which is R3, a contractible space. The group acts freely on it. And so uh, I see that my slides aren't in the best order. But if you have a contractible, if you have a group G, and if you have a contractible space on, on which the group G acts freely, 
uh, you can take the quotient of that by the action of G, and then you have a space and you can ask for the homology or the cohomology, uh, and that is by definition <laughs> the homology of the group G. Well, with coefficients in Z. So if I wanted the, the cohomology of this group, I could uh, calculate it from this equivariant space. Let me do that. Um, I'll do it in, in all in one, speed things up. So what have I done here? Um, the first command converts the data type of this space into a resolution of free G modules. So I'm taking the cellular chain complex of this infinite space, which will be contractible because it's the cellular chain complex of a contractible space. And then I take some functor. So I've decided to tensor my, my free resolution with the integers, with trivial action. So what I've actually constructed is the chain complex of this yoke. And then I can ask for the homology or the cohomology, whatever, of that uh, in degree two. And I'll find uh, this notation, uh, I'll find that it's z. So, so um, one zero means a z. Uh, I don't know if I have any to hmm? It does look like zero. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so I really don't know how. I mean, I, so if a, if, a, if a group has, the, that's my trivial group. <laughs> if the group is of size two, <laughs> that's what I write. <laughs> and then if it's infinite, I write it. I mean, it's uh, hindsight things would be, but. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so there we are. That, that's it. So let me go back to the slides. Um, that was the gap session. So now I have a pretty picture. This group that I was looking at, it's a Bieberbach group, meaning that it acts freely on Euclidean space. And when uh, we calculated a fundamental domain, we actually had to choose a vector v. And depending on what vector v you choose, th th that'll affect the combinatorial structure of the fundamental domain. So this is a, a picture that was produced for me by Mark Roeder uh, some years back. Um, this particular group, it turns out that the, the, um, the fundamental domain varies with v, but it doesn't it's independent of the z-coordinate of v, it, it just in this particular case. So if you take two vectors with the same v, with the same z, uh, two, two different vectors, but with the same z-coordinate, it just turns out in this particular example that you get the same uh, combinatorial fundamental domain. And so what Mark did was he varied over all x and y <laughs> to see the different fundamental domains that arose. And there are 10 fundamental domains, combinatorially different fundamental domains. And he represented one uh, for each color. I don't actually see 10 colors in this, but there are 10 colors in this picture. Um, and each color, what it, what it corresponds to is a vector v, z doesn't matter, in, in the plane, in the xy plane, with, with any choice of z. And then the color represents the, the combinatorial uh, type of the fundamental domain. So it, it, and some fundamental domains are very complicated. And for the same group, some are very simple. So if you want to do calculations, it can play to, to search around to have a nice um, fundamental domain. What's the difference between the two Sorry. Yeah, OK. Sorry, I went a bit too fast. So, so we have a, this particular group, number 165, which is a group that acts freely, it turns out, on, on three-dimensional space. So for each point v in three-dimensional space, you can ask for the, the Voronoi domain or the Dirichlet. Yep? And that's going to have a combinatorial structure. And if you take different vector v's, you're going to get possibly different, combinatorially different structures. In this particular case, 
the structure of the fundamental domain ha happens to be independent of the choice, the z coordinate in your vector x, y, z. So for each x, y in the x, y plane, and any z, you, you choose a vector, work out what's the combinatorial structure. They, it turns out that there are 10 different combinatorial structures, so as, associate a color to each structure and then plot the colors. Yep. Would be one of these. One of these. So every point with a with a dark red would have the same combinatorial structure. That every point with a light blue would have the same combinatorial structure. Every. I, I, my trouble is I don't see ten colors, but there are ten colors there. Um, and the fundamental domain. Oh, you don't see the fundamental domain. I mean, that we we saw one. I I I, I chose a, a random v, and we saw that it had nine vert. I mean, it, it was they, they can be complicated. Yeah. Um, you, you can picture the fundamental domain. I think I have that in a, in a future. I won't start <laughs> doing live programming. <laughs> um, OK. Um, OK, so this is, uh, so what I think I've explained is one way to represent the torus on a computer by using the, the universal cover uh, and group actions. Um, now I want to explain another way to represent the torus, or, or um, non-regular you know, non CW complex on a computer. Um, so let's go back to this regular CW complex in the left, which represents the torus. Yeah, so I've taken a sheet of paper, identified opposite edges. Uh, there's a cellular decomposition. And if you think about it, I hope, anyway, the attaching maps of any cell are homeomorphisms. So it's regular. So you can represent that on the computer using the, the, the face pull set. Um, <laughs> let me now talk about uh, what's called a discrete vector field, which is a notion that goes back to um, Foreman uh, back in the 1970s. So. I want to explain what a discrete vector field is. So a discrete vector field on a regular CW complex is, I think of it, as a collection of arrows. It's a collection of arrows, and the arrows go from a cell of dimension, each arrow goes from a cell of dimension n to a cell of dimension n plus 1. So you have some arrows going from 0 cells to 1 cells, some arrows going from 1 cells to 2 cells. Um, for a discrete vector field, any cell is involved in at most one arrow. A cell doesn't have to be involved in any arrow. But if it is inv by involved, I mean it's either the source or the target of at most one arrow. It, no cell can be involved in more than two arrows. So that's, that's grand there. Um, and that's essentially what a discrete vector field is. Um, in the picture over here, the cell F1 is the target of an arrow. The cell E3 is the source of an arrow. They're involved in arrows. But there are some cells like F2 is neither the source nor the target of an arrow. So we'll give that a name. We'll say it's critical. So the cells which aren't involved in an arrow will deem to be critical. Just a and so when you have a discrete vector field, you have arrow cells and then the, the, the non-arrow cells which are critical. Ah, drat. Is it E5? Uh, yeah. Where's E? Where is E5? E5 is. E5 is. So that's yeah. That's just clearly wrong. Um, yep, I'm wrong. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. I didn't. I must have looked at the top. Yeah. 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 No, I see. So that's a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. Oh yeah. That's the definition. Then I should have given that a discrete vector field <laughs> on a regular CW space. Uh, consists of a collection of pairings, I suppose is the fancy way to say it, uh, involving a cell of dimension n and a cell of dimension n plus 1, such that the dimension of the target cell is one more than the dimension of the source cell in any arrow. Um, any cell is involved in it. Oh, oh no, it, it, so the... the um, 
Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm going from uh, an arrow going from cell E I N to E J N plus one. So we require that E I N lies in the boundary of E J N plus one. I suppose, strictly speaking, these cells are all open, so I have to talk about in the closure of the boundary. And no cell is involved in more than one arrow. So that's a discrete vector field. Um, Let me say what we mean by an admissible discrete vector field. So if you have a vector field on a regular CW complex, um, we'll say then that a, a sequence of arrows from E1n to E1n plus 1, E2n to E2n plus 1, is a chain if the cell EI plus 1 of n lies in the boundary of EIN plus 1. So I, I think that picture explains it better than the words. A chain is a sequence of arrows in the vector field, like that. Um, a discrete vector field is admissible if no chains are cycles, so you don't have any chain going around in a loop, and no chain goes on to the right forever. So, for example, I, you can think of a, of a discrete vector field on the, the line. I mean, if you take the, the standard decomposition of the real line, you know, uh, 0, 1, 2, uh, I better put some minuses in, minus 1, minus 2. You could think of a discrete vector field that simply does this. That's a discrete vector field, but it wouldn't be admissible because it would go on forever. So if you want to uh, make it admissible, you could just change the directions of, say, the, the positive arrows above zero, going this way. Then you'd have a discrete vector field which uh, has, a, has a chain of any length you like, but it has no chain that goes on for indefinitely to the right. So that's admissible. Uh, and then comes, I don't know what happened there, oh, oh yeah, yeah. that's a, <laughs> um, a theorem due to uh, Foreman, I, I'm going to put in Henry White in as well because it, it all ties up with simple homotopy theory, so it's, Foreman introduced a very nice and, and, and important notation of, of vector fields, but it really goes back to simple homotopy theory. So suppose you have a regular CW complex of a space, like the torus, and you want to do calculations. So, so spaces can be very big. You, it, it, you might have an enormous regular CW complex, and you want to calculate the homology. To calculate the homology, you have to construct a chain complex, and then do things like Smith normal form. If your chain complex is big, the linear algebra won't work, so you want to make it small. So if you have a, a, an admissible discrete vector field, then it turns out that there's a homotopy equivalence between your regular space X and a probably non-regular CW space Y, uh, where the cells of Y correspond to just the critical cells of X. That's the, that's the, that's the game. So here is the picture. Um, of course, this is wrong now, isn't it, because of my E5. But let's have a look what went wrong. Uh, I claimed that I had two. No, no, so, yeah, yeah, so, so no, it's, it's fine, isn't it? My two, um, I've got two critical cells. It, I've, got, I've got one critical zero cell here, yeah, the V1. Every, every other zero cell is, is non-critical. So I have one cell here, and then I have two critical uh, one cells, E8 and E2, that's what I've called them. So I have my two critical cells here, and I hopefully have just one critical two-dimensional cell, and I just have one two-dimensional cell there. So that there's a homotopy equivalence. So the, the, the idea, which is very similar to what uh, Francis Sejera does in, in Kenzo, is you store the big structure, the full set, the regular CW complex, and you store a discrete vector field, which gives you a smaller representation of the space. And then whenever possible, you do your calculations down here. But if there are formulae or whatever you want to apply, you can do them over in, in, in the large case. So that's, that's the idea. Uh, this is a proof of what? Oh, of the theorem. <laughs> yeah. This is a proof of the theorem. 
So let me prove the theorem, well, I suppose, in the, in the torus case. What happens, I'm just doing it with one arrow. If you have one arrow in your uh, vector field, you can kind of see that that arrow corresponds to a homotopy of this edge. Well, actually, if you do it the right way around, <laughs> that one cell disappears. So this arrow corresponds to removing or changing the CW structure to a smaller one. And that's, that's, that's what you record on the computer, and, and you're here later. Gap session two, and then I have to think about how to do all of this. So. Let's have a look. Uh, oh, yeah, OK, OK, OK. Um, we'll do some biology now. <laughs> I, I don't know if this is in any way related to number theory, but uh, <laughs> um, when biologists discover proteins, uh, they store the information that they discover in a database, the protein database. Ah, there's, there's, let me move that for a second. Uh, and so I've chosen uh, the. It's a it's a, a, a human protein, which is referred to by biologists as the one v two x protein. And so I'm told that to th you can think of short proteins as being like, well, every protein is a sequence of amino acids, and in every amino acid, you've got lots of atoms, and there's something called a, an alpha carbon atom. So if you think of a protein as a sequence of amino acids, but just uh, view the, the alpha carbon atom, you've got a sequence of points in three-dimensional space. And so the biologists estimate the Euclidean coordinates of the points, so you can create sequences of points in, in three-dimensional space. Then you can join them up by edges or curves or whatever, splines, and you get a, a curve in three-dimensional space. And biologists say that usually a protein is a bit like a sponge. It's a, it's a complicated piece of string where the ends of the string are near the surface of the, of the sponge. So what you can do if you're a mathematician, you could join the ends together, and then you should have an embedding of a circle into three-dimensional space. So let, let's, that, that's what that picture was. <laughs> For this particular um, protein, that's the, the, the blue is, is the, the, my embedding. Uh, that's the embed, that's the circle, that's a knot. So now we have an embedding of a circle, and the question is, is it knotted? Or is it the trivial knot? And so on. And those, those are the things you might want to look at. So let, let's, let's try and do that. Now, some of these commands might take a a moment to to run. This is the only biology example, by the way. So, <laughs> um, all right. So what I'm going to do now? This does take a little bit of time, uh, but it's worth doing because you see how the program works. Um, let me do my best to recreate that not as a pure permutahedral complex of dimension three. Uh, so now it's, it's again, my, my, I'm using um, asymptote software to picture things, so we have to just wait a second. That's not right. OK, I've chosen the wrong. I've chosen the wrong. OK, well, I, I want, yeah, yeah, OK. You, well, you would get something like that. Uh, I mean, that was the wrong picture. <laughs> what did I choose? I don't know. I meant to take. I won't do it. Okay. I meant to take the, the knot. Let, let's go on. We have this pure permutahedral knot, which I'm going to. I hope this works now. What is it? Uh, I don't know what I did. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I haven't created it yet. I haven't created it. So I'm now going to create that um, knot as a pure permutahedral com complex. This takes a, a moment. Uh, so there must be 191 alpha carbon atoms in it, and I'm joining them all up. And then uh, it's very naive. I'm just thinking of three space as being tessellated by permutahedra, and then you do your best to kind of get see, you know, a permutahedral line. I hope this doesn't take. Yep, we're done. So it's it's involving uh, 1,000 odd permutahedra. 
I'd like to know, is it knotted? Um, what can I do? I can take the complement of the knot. So we're in three-dimensional space. Um, I just, my, 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 my K is just a sequence of, of tiles. And my complement is the, the things that aren't in the tiles. I take a finite box containing the knot, and then I just take the complement. So now I have the complement of the knot. Um, uh, I look at the... Well, I'm going to do a few things together, OK? I'm going to do a few things together. I'm going to look at the size of my... Not, which, wow, there are 418,000 permutahedra in the complement. <laughs> so as a regular CW complex, we're going to end up with a very large space. So I'm going to do something, whatever it is, you know, discrete vector field nonsense to make it smaller. Yeah, I, I won't go into the details. Um, and now we'll look at the size of the smaller one. It's probably still going to be big, but it's at least not as big as, <laughs> as, as that. So, so we've got something that's manageable. Um, let's go to a couple of things. Let's create, and this also may take some time, uh, a regular CW complex or a face lattice of that Oh yeah, it's done. Okay, so, so we have this as a regular CW complex and then uh, well, I'd like to maybe calculate the fundamental group because the fundamental group of a knot complement is, is a knot invariant. Um, I'll do something a little bit more. Um, so we have a knot, uh, K, Inside, and, and we have the complement. So the surface of the knot, surface of a knot is a torus. I mean, the knot, I'm thinking of, is three-dimensional. So the surface is a torus, and the torus belongs to the boundary of the complement. Yeah. Now, if I were doing this properly, I'd be working in, in the sphere. I'm not. I'm working in a cube. So the boundary of my complement has two bits to it. It has a sphere, the, 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 the boundary of the cube, and it has the torus inside. So F is the map which takes the boundary of the knot into the complement. Uh, and B is the source of F, so B should be a torus. Yep. B is a torus, it's the boundary of my knot. Um, so what am I going to do? Let me get there. Um, let me do a whole rake of things at once uh, and then explain what's happening all of the commands at once. So I'm going to contract it, <laughs> okay, because make it smaller. Uh, I've contracted my, uh, oops, where are we, um, space just to make it smaller. Uh, it's still pretty big, but now I'm going to ask for the, so that's as a regular CW complex, it's got whatever it is, 69,000 cells. But as a regular, as a non, as a, a non-regular space, you've only got two two cells and two one cells, so it's much smaller. So then we can do something like ask for the fundamental group, and it, GAP is is very good at playing with, with with finitely presented groups. It gives us the fundamental group. Um, in fact, we can do a bit more because what I would like is not just the fundamental group, but the fundamental group is a functor on spaces. And I have a, a, an inclusion of the boundary torus into the complement. So I'd like to take the fundamental group of, of that map. So the, the boundary, as I say, has two components. There'll be the sphere, just because I'm taking a finite box. And there's the real bit of the boundary, I want the torus. So there are two components in the boundary. Uh, one of these will correspond to the torus, I don't know which, and one will correspond to the, the sphere. Uh, and I want the fundamental group. Oh, well, well, it tells me here. I've done some investigation. This vertex 
it belongs to the torus part of the, comp uh, the complement. Uh, so now I'm going to take the fundamental group of this map F. So I should get a, a, a group homomorphism. Um, and there's the group homomorphism. And then in knot theory, going back to Waldhausen or whatever, it, this is really a complete knot invariant if you're careful about what you mean by that. Th this homomorphism tells us everything we need to know about the knot up to, hom uh, up to homeomorphism of the complement. So, so you could use that to dis decide what knot you've got. It's time for me to stop, isn't it? I started at 20 past, so I'll rethink about the, the problems, because obviously I, <laughs> I overshot. Maybe I'll do less gapping in the next session. And what I can do is I could put some problems up for those who want to think about them over the, the break. Um, if anybody's interested in playing with gap, no, what happened here? Um, um, here is a here are a couple of oh, I just leave the first one up the first one is enough Um, if anybody wants to, to play with that uh, during the break or, or afterwards or whatever, I mean, maybe we can start off after the break. I can, I can go through the answer to that. That might be the best thing for me to do. Rather than, uh, and then uh, I think I should stop there because it's a, it's a, it's a two-session session.